Hi everybody, we're going to try this again. Uh, welcome to Q&A with Amy. This week we are doing an interview with my dear friend Julia um, about narrative medicine and I am hoping that my internet connection stays on long enough that we can get Julia on. Um, if not, we're going to be moving to a Zoom. Uh, Julia and I will move to a Zoom and share the link with you all. This is, so this will be the last time um, to see if we can get connected before we move to Plan B. Again, I am I am so sorry. It's one of those days where apparently all of my children are doing homework at the same time. And what are you going to do? So I appreciate your patience as we try to bring this to you. Um, do me a favor, if you're on, do me a favor, throw me up a coffee cup, a little bit of love. I'm feeling a little stressed not being able to get everything hooked up for you. Because um, this is just, this is such good stuff that I'm really excited to share it today. Um, and again, I appreciate you hanging with me as we try to get everything working. So, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit buttons on my phone and see if I can find people. Uh, can you tell I have bifocals? Isn't that great? Um, yep. So, Julia, if you can see me, go ahead and leave a comment. Um, okay, you can see me. Can you leave? Julia, are you there? I am telling you, my internet connection is like poo poo today. So my phone went to half screen, which means it's trying to bring Julia on. And this will be the last go. Um, and then we're going to move it to a Zoom. <gasps> Julia! Did we do it? We did it. I'm so excited. Yay, I, technology did not defeat us today. I can see your beautiful <laughs> face. How are you, friend? I can see you are darling. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to, to talk with you today. I've missed just talking with you in general. This is a great opportunity. I know. I, I miss you as well. And people have been kind of bumping on and bumping off as I've been, you know, messing with the technology. So hopefully people will realize we've gotten connected and, and um, start. So if you don't mind, let me do a little bit of introduction and then you and I can just get going. How does that sound? Oh, Sounds great. Dear. There's a can little I, can bit I of ask a, a question. Can you hear feedback? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you hear that? Is it can just I, me? I, I, I don't know if it's coming from my or not. I don't hear any feedback or anything, but you are on a delay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll just move, we'll, we'll keep trucking. We'll see what happens. Okay, we'll see what happens. All right. Well, uh, as a reminder, my name's Amy. I'm the one that runs the page. I'm really excited that you guys checked in to see what the heck narrative medicine is all about today. And um, I'm, I'm an author and educator and pain coach, and I'd like to be your pain coach to help you get your pain under control. Enough about me. This is my friend, Julia. And Julia has, uh, Julia's got a bio like I do. She's, she's a little bit of a Renaissance woman. So I want you to know that she is a former college teacher with a master's in literature from the University of Texas. And she is a graduate of the Columbia University professional, with a professional certification in narrative medicine. This is not a widely known thing that's out there. And so it is so very special that Julia has stopped her day to share with us about what this is, because I think you guys are going to be really excited 
when you hear what narrative medicine is. But she is also a massage and yoga therapist specializing in treating people in persisting or chronic pain. She's been doing that for over 15 years now. She owns her own business, which is Rise Wellness in Austin, Texas. So if you happen to be nearby and looking for someone to treat you, here you go. And she did not put this on her bio, but I also need you to know that her and her brilliant friend, Lysanthia, started a company called Narrative Medicine. Is that correct? Narrative RX. Yeah. Narrative RX, that's what it was. And it is a brilliant continuing education company that teaches clinicians how to use the art of narrative to help those in chronic pain. So that's where Julia and I crossed paths is as I was writing my memoir and realizing all of these things that I was unearthing about my own story and continuing to find beliefs that were continuing to limit me. Um, I was chatting with one of my swim team mom friends who was an English um, in the English doctoral program who mentioned this narrative medicine thing. Julia and I crossed paths and I got to spend about a semester with her and Lysanthia exploring narrative medicine. And it was brilliantly eye-opening as a clinician, but also as a patient, like as somebody sussing out my own pain story. So um, I asked her if she would join us today. And um, Julia, would you just start with a little bit of your own story of how you bumped into chronic pain and, and narrative medicine and just give us a feel for how you got here? Sure, thank you. Uh, very similarly to you, I had another brilliant friend who just happened to mention it one day. Uh, I think like a lot of people in the wellness world, I had one foot in um, academia and one foot in uh, 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 wellness. I was doing massage therapy and I was doing um, I was working at University of Texas at Austin studying English. Uh, I apologize if I'm getting tripped up. I'm listening to myself talk from 15 seconds ago, so <laughs> I'm trying to focus. Uh, but, uh, so I, I started out uh, at UT Austin. I was studying English, I was studying stories. I was trying to find a way to integrate that into my uh, massage and yoga practice. I found that I was doing it naturally. Oh, did you interrupt? I didn't know if, no, okay. Sorry, there's so much of a lag. I apologize, guys. Technology is crazy. Uh, so a, a friend of mine, an, ac uh, an acupuncturist friend of mine, uh, who I was working with uh, as a client, um, she happened to mention this beautiful field that merges the two ideas. Uh, emerges the ideas of art and medicine. Um, things that I feel most people kind of toggle back and forth between in the wellness world anyway. And I was fascinated. She mentioned this program happening at Columbia University um, called Narrative Medicine that actually focused on the stories told in healthcare and how stories are a fundamental pro part of uh, healing journeys and, uh, and wellness journeys. And I realized that so little of A, the work I was doing in academia was focusing on healthcare and B, so little of the education I had gotten as a practitioner was offering stories. So it was a beautiful bridge between the two different disciplines. I, I couldn't agree more. And my background in, um, in religion and in, in Christian faith, we learn all about stories and the importance of passing down stories and exploring our stories. And so that has always been of interest to me as we, you know, as I've started helping people in pain is helping them understand their stories. And um, you, you just seemed like the perfect person to bring on. So yeah, I'm excited. So Julia, what is narrative medicine? Like, I know you and I, I mean, like that has meaning to you and I, but what is it? That is a great question. And it's so hard, as you know, it's so hard to put words around it because really at, at bottom, it's a practice and you have to experience it to know what we're talking about. If I had to put words around it, I would say, uh, it is a practice of listening and self-care and community building and social justice, all centered around stories, storytelling, um, 
and honoring voices and community. So one of the things I encourage members of this support group to do is to share their story, right? Like, because we all have them. We all have stories about all kinds of different things. Whether I tell you why, you know, why I chose the coffee mug I did this morning or why I made the decision I did about not wanting to move because my pain was so bad. It's, it's all story, right? So how can, yeah. how can support groups like this be a small part of narrative medicine in, in, in healing for people? Uh, I think that is a great question. And the answer has a lot of different parts to it. Um, first, just having a community of people listen to you can be the most validating, empowering part of uh, a healing journey. Um, or a sickness journey, you know, it's it, just to have somebody listen is so powerful. Uh, and also for me, what this, this practice of listening is, is the kind of meditation that allows me to take a step back to look at the story that I'm telling and to see if it's time for a shift or a change there. And sometimes by listening to other people's stories, uh, my, my story starts to cross pollinate with theirs in a really productive, collaborative way that allows shift and change. to. I, I think that is a phenomenal exp explanation and exactly what I experienced going through as, as a student of yours realizing that you know i would answer a question and i would have my own story and my own narrative but then i would start reading classmates and go oh oh but i resonate with a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that and then all of a sudden i would yeah. find my own story opening up yeah it's a it's a humbling uh, liberating and inspiring experience all at once. And I feel that those things are, those being, being, feeling humble, feeling free and feeling inspired are not just important for people, you know, uh, who have issues with persisting pain, but also for their caregivers, for their providers who get stuck in their ways of knowing about how to treat their patients the right way. <laughs> and as you know, when you, when you do this kind of work and you realize other perspectives are just as valid as yours uh, and perhaps might actually complicate or thicken your pers perspective in a productive way, you s that, that realization starts to have a ripple effect in your personal and professional life. I, I completely agree. Um, I, I'm, I'm currently running a five month group program um, and, and there's a group of six very brave women that have chosen to join and uh, they're all sharing their stories right now. And a question that I would have for you is as we become listeners of other people's stories, one of the things that, that can happen is we become affected by them if we're really listening, right? Mm -hmm. What are mm -hmm. suggestions that you have for those listening, be it, be it providers or caregivers or patients, you know, people experiencing pain themselves? What are some self-care or um, notes that you would have to the listener of, of hard, messy stories? One check your bias at the door as much as you can. If you think you know this story, if you think you've heard it before, forget what you've known. Try to see it with fresh eyes. Uh, two, uh, hone in. Slow down. I know that you can't really slow a person talking down, but you can focus your attention so much that you can start to notice particular words or images or phrases that start to call out to you. Remember those. Uh, you'll notice that, that people speak more poetically than, than we think we're speaking. Latch onto those really unique key phrases. Uh, and three, I would say probably the, the most important part is to listen with somebody rather than listening again. Mm -hmm. uh, one part of my graduate school experience was uh, I, I learned how to think critically. And, and that's such a great skill. So absolutely, especially this day and age, so important to learn how to think critically. Uh, but uh, we, we, I think, have been underdeveloped in that muscle of listening generously. And when you're listening to somebody sharing a painful story, a messy story, to think with them and to listen generously is 
po possibly the greatest gift you can give them and yourself because you might actually start to uh, notice uh, new things, have insights that you never would have had if you had been closed or thinking in that critical, hole punching kind of way. Mm, I think that's beautiful. Um, you mentioned self care was an important part of narrative medicine. Can you can, can you color that in a little bit? What does it so for somebody that doesn't you know? I think of self care and I think of essential oils and yoga and you know hot baths, right? I know that's not what you mean, but that is the image that comes to mind yeah. when I hear those things, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit in the lotus <laughs> position with my hands up and go, uh, um, and, and that's not actually going to care for me at all. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to say something a little radical. I have been shifting my notion of self-care from bubble baths and yoga and essential oils, which are all lovely and wonderful to a more kind of self-parenting notion of self-care, um, of being, being able to, just like a mother would, to, to hold yourself gently, but also to hold yourself accountable the same way a mother would. Um, and uh, so, so the self-care that happens in these groups, um, looking at yourself and your own personal bias, being honest, getting really honest about that, you know? Um, having the support of the group to go through these big self-realizations, you know, that everyone is having at once and knowing that it's okay and that you're human. And one of the biggest uh, uh, learning points of narrative medicine is that we are all fallible. There's all, we all have our blind spots. So owning that and working with a group that can reveal your blind spot to you and learning to be humble and accepting of those things can be, can be absolutely one of the best self-care regimens I, I've I've ever experienced. Uh, I, you, I mean, you're right up my bias alley. So, I, yeah, like, <laughs> like I do, I do think when we are in pain and we are listening to others' stories, that that there can be. I mean, that really can be a load on the nervous system. And so, breaking out the soft blankets and your favorite smells and your favorite foods and and listening to your jams and and mm -hmm. and getting in your bathtub, hot tub, rolling in the snow, whatever your you know, whatever your happy place is, I do think that that's really important. I'm just yeah. going to say it's really whatever makes you happy. It's not, you know, the list of things in Cosmo magazine. But I do completely agree that self care is really about getting honest. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's about, yeah. and it's not, a, it's not necessarily about pointing out other people's biases. It's about finding your own. Because it's care of self, not yeah. care of others. And that is the beginning of ethics. That is also that is also very true. And um, Julie and I, you know, we 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 cross pollinate, right? Because we we work with people in pain, but we also teach providers. And so, my you know my big my big deal is, hey, we got to listen to the story. And Julia teaches them how, and I just keep banging on the drum that we need to, you know, that that the things that the mm -hmm. things that we're taught as clinicians in clinic don't don't end up in the brains of someone in pain the same way. And then Julia teaches them, you know, why that is. And, and um, we're going to do, we're going to do a fun exercise that um, we, we did in class and we're going to look at a piece of art. Um, do you want to do that now? Sounds great. Okay. Let's do it. So uh, gang, okay. I posted up a picture of the weeping woman. Um, she's the weird looking chick in a bunch of different colors that that i popped up on the facebook page and uh julia i believe you're gonna ask us some questions about said lady yes i am i'm going i'm pulling up the picture myself right now seeing if i can do it on two devices at once again technology right uh just see if i can pull that And and I will I will no I will add oh there it is I can you see it on your computer yes. okay and I will add this like I will add her questions to the picture and then tuck that in the unit section so that you guys can access it later I would love to hear your answers if you want to answer while you're watching live do that and I will read them out but you know I, I want you guys to see some of this in action so take it away Miss Julia. Thank you so much, Amy. So uh, if everybody has uh, that image 
on their screens now. I'd like you to, uh, to, to pull it up and just sit with it for a moment. Um, if you know anything about Weeping Woman, which is the name of this painting, or Pablo Picasso, who is the painter who painted it, forget what you know. Let's check all of that at the door. And as much as we can, try to see it with fresh eyes. Uh, we're going to just, for time's sake, we're going to give ourselves about 30 seconds to sit still with this painting, to start to enter its space and perspectives, and start to notice the way it is telling us a story. So let's give us 30 seconds of silence right now. All right, so as we as we look at this painting, we might start to notice that it has a kind of a plot, even though it seems to be happening in one frozen moment, there are definite things happening here. Um, what do you think is happening? If you have any ideas, please pop them in the comments and uh, we'll talk about it together through the comments. While we're waiting for comments to pop up, maybe Amy could give me her ideas too. What do you, what do you think is happening in this painting? So, I, oh, is it this painting? Oh dear, uh, I'm tempted to try to hit the link and see what happens, but I think it's going to take me. <laughs> I think it's going to take me away from from where I want to be. Um, so let's. I I, oh, maybe I'm I'm afraid right, of the I same was thing. Say, I you know. Technology is good, but you and I are struggling a little today. Um, Tell us what you think you're looking at, Margaret. I don't want to describe the painting myself because I don't want to skew your perception. Right? Okay, I, I got it on the... Yes, that is it. That is the painting, Okay, Margot. That's it. Uh, she is joining us from the Netherlands. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. All this way. Yes, it is the one you posted earlier. Yes. Yeah, so, so Amy, what do you see in this painting? What do you think is happening? So Just literally, I what's happening? I see, um, I see a woman that looks like she has gotten dressed up to go someplace, and um, there appears, at least to me, to be some fear about that. Um, her eyes don't look right. They don't look like they're focused on anything, um, and. It, it is interesting to me how the colors are really bright, uh, around, like like what I think is her hat and kind of the background is very sunshiny and yellow, but yet as we get closer to her face, the color disappears like she's lost her voice. And the the green, like it's just, it's, it's, not, it's not pleasant and bright like the rest of the colors of the painting, it's more sickly. And so I wonder if she is, painting on another self to, to get ready to go out into public with her pretty, pretty hat. <sighs> That's fascinating. Uh, you, you used a great phrase that it looks like she's lost her voice in the center of the painting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what, why, you, why you see that, where you see that? I can. Um, again, the, the, the fact that we have all these bright colors up and around what I'm going to call the left side of her face from where I'm looking at it. <laughs> and, and then it, it, be, ooh, it begins to fade and we have, a, we have a hand near her mouth and over her mouth, but the color just completely disappears. It, it looks like she might be attempting to bite her nails, but there, there's fret and the, and the unfocused eyes are what tells me there's, there's fear there. Something is happening that, that is unpleasant and, it, and it's from the mouth. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting that the center of the painting is situated around that mouth and the hands and that the color drains as you get closer to there. So I agree with you, something interesting happening with voice. And it seems to, seems to convey the tone of fret and fear 
like you said. So you've done a beautiful job of exploring the difference in color from the outside of the painting toward the center. What about the differences in shapes? Notice any different shapes? I, I do, and I, it, so this is, so my context is coming from a children's lit minor. And so we had to learn mm. to, to dissect um, children's books and the images they're in. And I, you know, Dr. Trites, I know you're part of this group. So here's your call out. So the teacher that actually taught me this is part of this group. But she always talked about if we look at, if we look at characters that are, we're supposed to um, relate to, that are warm, that are cuddly, they're almost always round-ish, right? And mm. characters that we are supposed to be afraid of or are supposed to represent things that are frightening are much more angular. So like if you, if you think about the monsters in Monsters Incorporated by Pixar, Sully is very fluffy and very round. Mike is literally a circle. <laughs> He's, he's literally a circle. And even Randall, who's our scary character, isn't angular. But if you look at some of the villains like Cruella de Vil and the, uh, Dr. Facilier from Princess and the Frog, they're very, Jafar, they're very angular and triangular. And so in this photo, I see much softer lines around the outside of her character, her, her ear, her hair, even the hat is that like pseudo angular, but you get into that mouth and all of a sudden there's points and triangles and rectangles and there's hard edges that don't exist on the outside of the photo. And so I feel comfortable, but the closer I get into her face, the more uncomfortable I become just looking at it. Like I don't, I don't like it. It creates a feeling of disruption inside. Brilliant, brilliant observation. As you point this out, I'm also noticing that the hands change shape from the outside in that green and yellow to the inside where it becomes that icy blue. Uh, the, the fingers are no longer cur uh, curved, but have a kind of angularity, especially on this left hand side where that whole hand is on the inside. It's, that is such an interesting observation. I wonder what that can tell us about the lived experience of suffering. You know, the, the name of this painting is Weeping Woman, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what does this shift in geometry teach us about what it is to suffer? I would love to hear anybody's thoughts on that before I babble, because Julie and I literally could do this all day. Oh, all day. Thank you, Margo. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was calling you Margaret earlier. Margo says to me that oh, it disappeared. Oh, to me, the shapes in the middle look sharp, like glass or pieces of a mirror that distort. Ooh, very interesting. I like that. So in the middle, in the middle we have like shards of glass and mirror. What might that tell us about the lived experience of suffering? Can we? Can we make any speculations about, oh, thank you, Marco. Can we make any speculations about why there might be mirrored fragments in this area right here as this woman is weeping? Maybe an, a better question is, what is it about sadness that feels like there are shards of mirror? And I know there's any ideas? There's always a delay on the comments, which is always sad. I see possible oh, I see mirrored in the shapes. I can I can see that. Absolutely. It you know, I, I workshopped this painting probably ten times before I noticed because somebody pointed it out to me that there's a tear rolling down the cheek. If you look uh your left, the woman's right, there's a tear rolling down the cheek there in yellow. It took me forever to see that until somebody else pointed it out to me. And yet every bit of that interior space is almost tear shaped, tear colored. It's also the shape of a heart, mm -hmm. right? You actually get a literal heart mm -hmm. uh, on this 
toward the right hand side of the angular centered piece. So what does all of this, all of these observations about the, the voice being stuffed back in, the, um, the shape, the angular coldness of this heart shaped thing, tell us about what it is to suffer. To I find it interesting that the, the, the negative space or the lighter color really starts at her eyes. And I, I, that, mm. that would be a new observation for me. Um, but that it starts at the eyes and it comes down the face as though all of this, right? This, this part that, and I'm colored by my, my conversation with my group today, but we, we were talking about how hard it is to share the truth of our stories with people that don't know, which, which does often include our, our professional team, right? And so the yeah. color does get drained out of the story and, and it becomes facts instead of how our pain impacts us. It, it feels like glass coming out of our mouths because it's not honest. It's, I'm, I'm giving you the facts and the figures of, of my pain and I'm giving you a number, but I'm not actually telling you what it's doing to me, how it's draining the life from me, how it's fracturing me as a, as a human, that I'm not whole anymore. And I, I feel like when mm -hmm. we get an opportunity to look at this, that someone has expressed that for me. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. And that clinical encounter helps me kind of uh, understand a little bit more clearly what you were saying before about the performance of putting on all of this, you know, fancy clothing, the softness that like the world wants to see when actually inside it feels this broken, fragmented thing. And I love the idea of the mirror too, um, because to me, that almost gives this fragmented real part here a little tinge of hope that there's this moment for reflection right in in that the, the deepest part of ourselves that we don't want to show the world this capacity for self reflection this this um hint of promise that that might only be possible with fragmentation mhm mm mhm mm that it it's too much to it, i a couple it's too much to come out all at once so if it comes out in shards yeah. and pieces that's yeah. off, that's often safer yeah, absolutely. I saw a couple of comments come in. I can't see them anymore. Jennifer, Do you mind reading Jennifer, who is joining us from Australia, she says, I see the tears as a way of communicating when there are no words. The tears tell the truth. That reminds me, too, that what we've been talking about here, the, are the eyes, the tears, the mouth, the hands, these are all organs of communication, right? So inside this little box that's kind of coming down from the eyes, this angular structure coming down from the eyes, it's the hands and the mouth together that are, it seems to me, um, they're, they are trying to tell a story. So I think that's a beautiful observation. I love that. And um, Margot says, there seems to be a disconnect between inside and outside. What is inside doesn't make it outside in the way that it's experienced on the inside. Can you read that last sentence I again? Can. What what is um, what is inside doesn't make it outside the way that it's experienced internally. Ah, brilliant. brilliant. Oh, there's a kind of border here, a literal straight edged border that can't really be crossed, which I think is just uh, supported by the fact that we can't tell if she is trying to keep it in or it's trying to get out, you know? Um, I think that's a brilliant observation and probably why that interior world looks so very different from the I, I, in that same so, In that same idea in the photo, the literal borders of that communication space that we've just talked about are they're thicker they're drawn thicker than than most of the rest of the that 
portion of the photo and they're angular, like, like they're trying to contain something. Mm hmm. Mm, like, like a container. I keep, I kept tripping myself up by calling it a box. It's not a box, but it has that feeling it, to it, right? A container. Right. Whether I'm trying yeah. to push it back in or, or, you know, guide it out or, or I mean, I could even make a case that one hand is trying to guide it out and one hand is trying to push it back in. Like, yeah, yeah, like, for sure. There's a, it's a tug of war happening here. And you know, the more I'm looking at it, the more I don't know who's winning. Uh, if you look at the eyes, as you brilliantly pointed out, it, they're not being contained. It's like broken glass. It's like something has shot out of both of them. It hasn't been contained. Even what I want to call a box is kind of askew, you know? Um, this fragmentation is, give, I think is the reason why just looking at something like this gives us that feeling of anxiety. You know, uh, and things like this are difficult to look at for periods of time. And, uh, you know, in addition to that kind of uh, exhaustion, listening exhaustion you can get from sitting with something and really paying attention, it's also just hard to look at things that are contained. And, uh, and yet, just as uh, one of our readers suggested, there can be a, a mirror held up in the So, it, were there any other comments that, Anybody wanted to get in before I give you guys a little homework to do later uh, centered around this painting? Any other observations about any of the, the details here that might lead us to a more uh, nuanced understanding of what it means to we? All right. So if there are no more observations, at this point, we would typically go into the close reading, we would typically move into a reflective writing portion of the workshop. I won't, I won't belabor this call with that. Instead, we're going to do it a little differently. I'm going to give you two options uh, for prompts to write to at home that are inspired by this discussion. So after listening to this close reading that everyone has contributed to very uniquely, uh, you might notice that your own personal stories might have shifted in relationship to this painting. So as you write at home, you want to write in the shadow of this experience. You're going to set a timer for five minutes only. Um, and as soon as that timer's done, you're going to stop writing. The goal is not to write well. It's just to get words on the page that feel honest. Um, I, I like to say that writing is an experience. It'll teach you what you didn't know you already knew. So treat it like an experiment. Uh, usually we would read these uh, exercises after we're done writing to each other. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that here. So I'm going to welcome you to post your five-minute timed writing prompt, whatever you, uh, whatever you wrote to the prompt. Uh, you can post that in response to the picture of the painting itself. And then if anyone would like to jump on there and comment or reflect on each other's posts, that is very, very welcome. We want to reflect on each other's writing with the same generous attention to detail. We gave the original artwork. So you might notice particular words or phrases your friends have used. And all those words or phrases landed in. So the prompts that I like to use for this painting, and I'll give you two to see which one pulls most to you. Uh, first is, uh, write about a place you've seen this face before. Where have you seen this face before? Number two is give this painting a voice. So either one of those prompts, whatever's calling to you, you will write for five minutes. At the end, you'll put your pen down, even if it's in the middle of a sentence. You'll be surprised how often when you land in the middle of a sentence, it's exactly where it was supposed to land. Uh, and then reflect, if you, if you did, uh, uh, if you do uh, post your writing, please respond to uh, at least two or three other students who have posted their writing as well, just to pay, pay the feedback forward, because that would be such a generous thing to, uh, to listen and, and reflect on somebody else's writing. Oh, how I hope you guys have enjoyed this time like I have. I'm so glad we got the tech worked out so that we were able to do this. Um, 
Julia, if, yes. if people want to learn more about this, because I do think these exercises are incredibly helpful in breaking open, uh, in breaking open the places that we can't see within ourselves. Um, where, where, where this, uh, and this is on the fly guys, so she may shake her head at me, but where can they go for more? Like, is, are, are there, is there a Facebook group? Is there something they can join or a place where they can find you to meander? Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so you can go to our, our website, which is narrativerx.com. It'll take you um, to a website where you can put your email address in our little join our community page. Uh, and if you put your email address in there, I send out monthly newsletters. I won't spam your inbox, but I do send out monthly newsletters that will invite you to join our monthly Zoom workshops where we do something very similar to this, but in uh, a, a way that you'll get a chance to jump on and speak as well and interact with, pe with people from all over the world. It's wonderful. Uh, we have a lot of folks actually from the Netherlands. So Margo, you would fit right in. Um, and uh, these groups are normally around, you know, 15 people large, and it's just such a great way to interact on an international level with, you know, dear hearts and kindred spirits. Um, and then I also teach a nine week course, usually uh, two or three times a year. I think this year it's going to be twice. Um, we actually already filled our first course. Uh, it's going on right now. It just started this past week. Yay. So the dates for the second course hopefully will be coming out. Soon, but I'll be sending all of that uh, information in the newsletter as I get it. So sign up for our newsletter on narrativerx.com. Oh, and before I forget, we do have a, a, a fun Facebook group. Uh, it's called Painful Stories and How to Hear Them. Um, and it's a really cool group of people just sharing poetry and artwork that inspires them or that they've used in their in their uh, their their pain care practices or, or pain journeys. Um, so join us there. Uh, and uh, I'd love to connect with you. Also, feel free to reach out to me personally, just through direct message here too. Wonderful. And and now that you're part of the group, you, it, would it be all right if they tag you within the group? Absolutely. I'd love that. Wonderful. It's, honor. um, it's really an honor to, to be here with you, Amy, and to be in a group of people who have these lived experiences of, of crime. I think we've been siloed too long between providers and patient for people dealing with pain. And I think it's so important that we create these bridges where we can come together and talk to you. I want to hear all of your stories. And she totally means that. Like she, when she says that, she means it like I mean it. Like ta tag her. Um, I, I will say she was recently married. So if you guys end up Facebook friend, you can see all her pretty, pretty wedding photos, which was absolutely love it. Just lovely. I love, I love that you and Lizanthia were both able to finally get married in this crazy 20, 20 like holy cow Maybe as safely as we could and we're happy it's behind That's us now. <laughs> wonderful but um thank you for coming on and and sharing with us a little uh, just, i mean this is this is like the tip of the iceberg ladies like this really? this is just a tip but i wanted you to experience what it can be like to really look at a story and 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 break that in, into our own experience right because if you know, if, if we were a, a group that had um, lost children or, or kids to drunk driving, we would read this photo completely, you know, we would read this painting differently. Yeah. So Absolutely. your experience matters and it's important. And I do hope, I will post up um, Julia's prompts under the picture, but I do hope that you will share with us your thought because you're going to make us better by doing it. And hopefully it will give mm -hmm. something back to you as well. So thank you for joining us today. I'll be back next week with um, SI Joint Stuff. Woo -hoo. Um, and, and Julia will be in the group and all you have to do is give her a little tag. And much like the rest of our guests, she will come in when she is able, but Facebook will at least notify her that somebody's waiting at her. Right on, thank you so much. Thank you, Julia, we'll see you later. Bye.